Hi, my name's Rob Campbell. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, when I was first asked to do this, my gut reaction was, yeah, sure, of course, I want to, to help any way I can, but I thought I'm gonna do a presentation that I've already done, it's just easier. Um, but then there's been an issue that's been really bugging me for the last 18 months. I mean, to be honest, it's always bugged me, but just for some reason, the last 18 months, it's been needling the hell out of me. And I thought there'd be nothing that would undermine my argument more than using a presentation that I've done before, which you'll discover why shortly. Um, so I decided to do a new one, like full disclosure, um, I had a few hours to put it together. So there's probably more holes in it than eat them cheese. Um, so I hope you bear with me, but uh, we'll give it a go. Um, let's start by putting this on, uh, do that. I, absolutely do not want to see me you might still be able to see me but i can't see my face and that's much easier um so this is a presentation called why we need more cluff in creativity um old big ed and old big ed is the man the myth and the legend for people of a certain age brian clough uh brian was the manager of nottingham forest football club which unsurprisingly is from nottingham um he joined the club in 1975 in january He'd had an okay career. Um, he'd had some highs. Joining Nottingham Forest was an absolute low. Um, Forest were, I think, 13th in the second division. Um, they had not had any major success uh, for like 20 years. And even then that was like a, a one-off. They were the epitome of just uh, mediocrity. Um, I'm not even good mediocrity, they were second division mediocrity. Um, and yeah, so it was very surprising he joined, um, but quite frankly, at that point in his career, he was lucky with Nottingham Forest. That's how far he had fallen. Um, the following year, he brought his assistant manager, Peter Taylor, with him. They'd been together on a number of uh, clubs over the years. And while this presentation ultimately is talked about Brian Clough, it has to be said that so much of what he achieved is because of the impact and influence of Peter Taylor. And my God, what an impact they had. You know, in 1975, they were, as I said, 13th in the first, uh, second division. Um, they got promoted in 1976. In 1977, their first year in the first division, they won. They beat Liverpool to the title. Liverpool were the undoubted kings of Europe. Um, they then beat Liverpool in the League Cup as well, and they won the Charity Shield. They had incredible success. But all of that, which is incredible, pales into insignificance, because in 1979, they won the European Cup, beating Malmo. The epitome of the football club potential in that time was won by a Midlands club that only like three years before was just in the middle of the second division. But what makes it even more amazing is they went on into the European Super Cup where they beat Barcelona. And then the following year, even more incredibly, they retained the European Cup by beating Hamburg with the then most expensive player in the world and their team, Kevin Keegan. So Nottingham Forest achieved the impossible. Um, what Leicester City did a few years ago in the Premiership is amazing. But compared to what Nottingham Forest did in four years, winning the league, winning Charity Shields, winning the European Cup twice, and winning the European Super Cup, there's no comparison. And in fact, in 1984, Forest were robbed of maybe getting to another European Cup final when it got found out that Anderlecht had bribed the referee to make sure that he put them through at the expense of Nottingham Forest. What they achieved was incredible. And what it did to the city was also incredible because ultimately they gave the city a sense of pride and a sense of identity. You know, the Midlands is often maligned by <laughs> England as just this like nothingness. Um, and suddenly here is a city that were kings of Europe, a sense of identity and pride. And let me tell you, there were two little boys in Nottingham where this affected them greatly. Uh, that's me and my best friend Paul. I'm with the dark hair. That's Paul. Um, we were very young and impressionable, obviously, at that age. And suddenly, 
the city where we came from was talked about as being champions. And literally, what we saw as the potential for our future changed then. Um, I was blessed with having amazing parents. My mum was Italian as well, so that gave me a greater outlook. But Nottingham Forest ultimately led us believe that miracles could happen. And it's interesting that I use the word miracles because there is an amazing documentary called I Believe in Miracles that if you're interested in just seeing, you know, triumph over adversity and leadership and character and progressiveness, then you should watch this. Um, yes, it's about Nottingham Forest, but really it's a story uh, that belongs in Disney more than reality. And I'm so honoured that I got to live it um and be part of it in some way this actually isn't about um when brian joined nottingham forest this is actually um around a particular incident in 1974 when he joined leeds united as the manager he joined leeds a team that had just won the first division title were runners up in the european cup they were runners up in the fa cup they'd actually won the fa cup the year before you know they were they were the team like there was a a majesticness about them. And Brian joined them as manager in 1974, but he only lasted 44 days and he was fired after that. And it's a story that's been well documented in the uh, David Pierce book, um, uh, David Pierce book, uh, uh, The Damage United. The Clough family think it's unfair that he, he made too much of a character of what Brian Clough is, and maybe that's fair. But the general sentiment of who he was and how he um, acted and what he believes. Having seen Brian for almost 20 years in Nottingham Forest, I definitely can relate to it. But the whole premise of this presentation actually features on the 44th day of his tenure at Leeds when he was fired. Because he was asked to appear on a TV show about his sacking. And what made it more spicy is that the other guest was Don Reavy. For those of you who don't know who Don Reavy was, Don Reavy then was the England manager, but previously he had been the Leeds manager and been the, uh, the person that had helped them win the division title to help them come second in the European Cup. Um, he was very proud of what he'd achieved. And quite frankly, Don Reavy and Brian Clough loathed each other. Brian had been very vocal about what he felt were Leeds shortcomings. And Don Reavy, a very proud Yorkshireman, did not take kindly to that. So what I want to do is basically show you a clip of this. Um, and while I'll start the clip slightly before the focal point I want, I want you to, if possible, um, look at 17 minutes, 50 seconds. It's probably about 40 seconds after I start because that's where the, the real heart of what I want to talk about comes in. Um, let's hope this works. We shall see. Yes. Nope. <laughs> so we'll go to 17 minutes, nine. Like this. But when you talk about honesty, if honesty is going to destroy the game, then you're in all kinds of trouble. I think you're doing the game. I think you're doing the game a great disservice. Yes, I would. In other words, that position is that you're too ready to shoot your mouth off. So that. now, when you talk, about I would let me ask the question first. Let me ask the question first. You talk about you talk about winning the championships better or, or differently. Our record is there to be seen for eleven years. Yeah. Right. The first four to five years, I've always said this: we played for results. The last four to five years, we've been the most entertaining side by crowd entertainment and topping charts with national newspapers and television. Also, Don, the disciplinary chart. The disciplinary chart. You topped that. We topped that once. Well, you topped it for the last two or three years. No, 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 no. That's, not, that's not true. Um, it wasn't 100% right, I will agree. Sorry. It wasn't 100% right, discipline on the field, and last year I was straightening it out. Well, it was. It was. You were yeah. the top. Yeah, yeah. But when you, you see, Brian, when you talk about coming to take the Leeds job and you had all these things and all these worries about stepping in marshes and one thing and another. Which I had. Yes, you had. But why? Why did you come from Brighton to Leeds to take it over when you'd criticised them so much and said we should be in the second division for this and we should do this and we should do that? Why do you take the job? Well, because I thought it was the best job in the, in the country. Of course it was the best job. I was taking over the Leeds champions. Yeah, you were taking over the Leeds champions. You were taking over the best bunch of players that you've ever seen. Well, I, ever, I didn't know about the players, Tom. 
You didn't know? I, I didn't know them intimately like you do. But I know you were the league champions, and I was taking over the league champions. I wanted to have a crack at the European Cup this year. Yes. I think that was near and dear to your heart also. Yeah. Yes. Um, I wanted to win it. I wanted to do something you hadn't done. Now, when I said, I think I said it to Trevor Cherry, actually, or most of the players, he said to me, what can you do that the boss hadn't done? You, the boss, referring to you. And I said, I want to win the league, but I want to win it better. Now, there is no other reply to that question. No. Because you had won the league. Yeah, but there's no way you could win it better. Why it's not? Only, no, 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 no. But that's the only hope I've we're, got. We don't, we don't lose four matches, then. But that, well, I can only lose three. No, no, no. no I no. couldn't give any other answer. And no. I wanted to win the European Cup. So, the, the about unsigned so, contracts. Hang on, it's all gone to shit. All gone to shit. Oh, I know why. Okay, so the part that I absolutely love, and there's lots of parts, and if anyone, um, fancy that you should look it up on YouTube because it's like 25 minutes of just back and forth and manipulation and just intrigue and just fight um, but the bit I love the most is when Brian Clough says win better he doesn't want to just win he wants to win better and for him winning better is with a better disciplinary record or losing less matches or scoring more goals but it's really had a huge impact on me, that win better. And the reason I say that is because I worry that as an industry, we're kind of about duplication these days. Um, our aspirations, if we have any, to win better is far more around the operational side of the business rather than the work that we produce. And that blows my mind because if the work isn't moving us forward, then it's literally moving us backwards. And win better for me. When I first heard that, it became like a a personal um, personal cause. You know, how do we win better? You know, good. You know, good is often good enough. And like, but how can we do something that's even better? And I mean that in through the work or. You know, it's got to be something that really impacts the work that we do and how we're doing it. It isn't about the operational behavior. I mean, I get that. Um, and that's an important part of it. But I'm obsessed with basically finding a way to make creativity move forward because I, I genuinely believe that creativity in whatever field can solve anything. And yet, as an industry, yeah, we just seem to be doing the same thing over and over again and championing it as if it's revolutionary. So what I thought I'd do is uh, Clough starting 11, which are basically just 11 thoughts that were originated, you know, from Clough in some way, but ultimately have an effect on what I think can help us win better. And that might be down to the work or the people in it or just how we look at what we do. I mean, it's pretty, as I said, I did this presentation in a few hours in a day, so it's a bit ramshackle. And I'm not even suggesting that any of this will be revolutionary, because um, it absolutely won't be. Um, but it might be something that reminds us why we're here, and what the focus is, and what we can actually achieve with creativity, which I assume is what we all want. And let me tell you, creativity can achieve things that other uh, approaches calm. Um, it allows people to feel stuff rather than just do stuff. It allows people to change things rather than just stay the same. It allows us to move forward rather than just fall back. And for me, uh, this Clough Starting 11 are hopefully little nuggets that might help someone when they're at a point where they think they might be okay but there's the, something bugging them in them it might be that little seed that helps them to, to just push on because the work is the sun that's what we should be doing and the work should always be moving things forward because like Clough 
he wasn't happy with good enough. He wanted to be audacious, even if that sometimes took bad turns. So here we go. Um, this is Peter Shilton. Uh, Brian Clough absolutely loved Shilton. When he bought him, he basically said he's like uh, and 10 points on the table straight away because he could save goals that were almost destined to go in under any other goalkeeper. But the thing here is learn from the best, but don't aspire to be like them. Uh, we have a lot of uh, self-appointed gods in our industry um, or, you know, people who've done an amazing work and we've decided that they are the gods. And you know what? They deserve it. They, the people who have actually made a difference and are continuing making a difference. That's astounding. But so much of us, I hear a lot of us that are basically trying to be like them as opposed to, you know, be inspired by them, but inspired to want to go further. Um, I've always said to people in my team, not in any way that I'm associating myself with the people that, you know, we're referring to as the best in the industry. Um, but you shouldn't aspire to be me. You should, you know, no one would. But you should aspire to be able to get away with the things I've been able to get away with. Um, the stuff that I've been able to bring in into the creative solutions, the projects I've been able to find. That's what they should be aspiring to, not, not being me. And then they should find a way that they can do that in a more interesting, intriguing, challenging, creative way. Um, but learning from the best but not aspiring to be like them is an incredibly important message. Because if we only want to be like the people who are already seen as the peak right now, then this is it. And frankly, there isn't that much work at the moment that's out there that really excites me personally. And I'm old, I've seen a lot. And that's not saying that we're not doing exciting things. But my God, I'd like to think our best days are ahead of us, not our past. And I believe they could be, but part of that is basically not to fall into the trap of aspiring to be like our gods, um, but just learning from them and then beating them. Uh, this is Viv Anderson. Uh, he was a defender at Nottingham Forest. He was also the first person of colour to ever play for England, which is wonderful for him, but it's a disgrace that England had, you know, had such a prejudiced view and, you know, it's arguably still got it, but anyway, won't get, that's for another presentation. But the other aspect is don't repeat what's gone before. Um, similar to the previous point, it's like, just because something's worked doesn't mean you should repeat it. Um, like always look for how you can push things further, move things on the next chapter. There is a, there is a reluctance sometimes to do that because we feel that clients know what they want and know what they like. But our job is to help them be better than even they thought they could be. And that can only happen. I'm sorry, I've just seen that I'm in the top corner of this bloody screen again. I don't want to be. There's my blooming, I can't see the mouse you see, so it's a nightmare. There we go. Um, so if you're just going to repeat what you've done before, I mean, at some point, just create a bot then and do it. Um, it's vitally important that we're always moving things forward. And the reality is culture is changing always at a rapid rate. And if you go into the shadows and see what's really going on in the subculture nuance and you, you play to them as an insider rather than an outsider, you should naturally be moving forward anyway. But if you just want easy, then I get why it would seem logical to just repeat what's gone before. But if you want to actually make a difference, it's always about finding a way to push things forward. Um, I know we all want that, but sometimes we say the, uh, the trap of time or money makes repeat uh, more acceptable. And I just personally don't believe that should ever be the case. Um, John Robertson. Uh, Brian Clough had two names for him, the little fat man, and the magician, uh, because John didn't uh, run very fast, but his technique allowed him to create space out of nothing. And they say if the internet was around when John was playing, then he would be up there with the greatest of all time. Um, and having seen him through my earliest years, I totally understand why that's the case. Um, but this lesson, you know, is uh, never let the competition dictate your approach. John didn't. John had one way of playing. To be honest, it was the only way he could play. Um, so regardless of the competition, he stuck with what he was great at. Um, and he found a way to adapt it at the times, but he stuck with what he was. And the reason why I think that's important is, you know, I've seen a lot of situations where people have talked about white space 
um, or disrupting the category. And I get it. I, I totally get it. I've been doing that for a long time. But at the heart of it also is this viewpoint that why is it a white space? And sometimes it's because technology hasn't allowed companies to go there before. But also sometimes it's like, why would you let your competition dictate where you go? Why would you own what your authenticity is, what you're really great at, and embrace that and take that on rather than be forced to change simply because somebody else has already done a version of that. They've just not done a great version. And I just believe that there's a, a real opportunity um, to play to your strengths rather than what other people want you to do. And we all accept that. But quite often we talk about white space as if it's like the holy grail, where actually uh, your authenticity, in my opinion, uh, is always even more powerful creating change and creating interesting work. Psycho, uh, he was an amazing player, not the best manager, but he was an amazing player and God, I love him. Um, this is about standards and graft and it's not cool to say, and I appreciate that, you know, there is a lot of pressure on people and I'm not trying to add to that. But by the same token, I don't think shortcuts or hacks are always the best way as well. We're, we're, we're presenting shortcuts and hacks as if we're really smart being able to do that. And sometimes I get it, but that is nothing compared to sticking to standards, just putting effort in, like just fucking working hard, like really getting into it, caring about the work till the last possible second. Um, and that's not the last possible second before we have to print the deck. It's like constantly thinking about it all the time and having the standards that you want to hear. Um, I get that sometimes, you know, it's under incredibly difficult conditions. And sometimes you should be pulling out of that, in my opinion, anyway. But standards and graft, when you know what's really important, you fucking sweat for it. Um, I think that's so important. Um, it gives you a level of substance and people can feel when you've sweated the details. Um, craft ultimately has come from somebody grafting, like working hard, constantly looking at that. And it might not be the cool thing to say, and there absolutely has to be, uh, there has to be some level of respect um, to the individuals doing it. I mean, I, I certainly don't want people, you know, pushing themselves to, the, to a point where they don't know how to cope anymore. That's not what I'm talking about, but I am talking about love the work, sweat for it, really push yourself and put effort in rather than just accept the first thing that comes to mind because you can tell the difference when somebody cares and they're living up to something rather than just simply going down to what they can get away with and for me good enough should never be good enough even if some people would accept it uh trevor francis uh the first million pound footballer he wasn't actually, I think Brian Clough ended up saying 999,999 to not make him the million pound footballer, but you know, the newspapers got him. Um, and another funny story is Brian Clough was brilliant at making sure people didn't get too big for their boots. So when uh, Trevor Francis was being presented to uh, the media, uh, Brian Clough turned up in his uh, tracksuit top there with his badminton racket I think, because he'd just been playing badminton with another Forest player, just to make sure that Trevor Francis didn't get too big for his boots. But what this is about is about always being open to exploring, experimenting, and ultimately making better mistakes. Uh, Clough was great at just introducing new to things. Like he, he was great at trying new techniques, trying new players, going for some big audacity and being happy to accept when it went, wasn't working. Because for him, a team needs to always be playing to the edge of what the next team is going to be rather than in the middle. Um, it has to always bring in new possibilities. And I think from a creative perspective, that's something that we don't do enough of. Uh, again, I think we often stick with what we know. And that's brilliant. I'm not knocking the, the potential and capabilities of that. but finding people who aren't from the industry and finding people who can you know, introduce something else and exploring and experimenting that. That's something that I feel uh, we could all do more of in our industry. 
So this is Kenny Burns. He was a brute of a player. He used to be a striker, I think. I think he was at Birmingham before, I'm not sure. And Clough hired him and made him a defender. And he and Larry Lloyd, my God, they were brick shit houses. You would not get past them. Um, and basically, what they were great at was they were very comfortable with uncomfortable. Like whatever happened, they could adapt really easily and quickly. And I love that. That whole be comfortable with uncomfortable. For me, that's such a fantastic uh, attitude to have. Not try and create the environment that you feel comfortable in, but embrace the environment that you're in, whatever it is, and just see what is possible from that. See what you can turn into that. Um, there's a great book, I think it's Tim Hartford, uh, called Messy, and it's about my favorite subject, chaos. Um, and there's a great story. There's a TED talk for it uh, as well, worth looking up to. But it's like sometimes when you you are comfortable with uncomfortable, like things you never imagined happen. And I think with Kenny Burns and Larry Lloyd, an ex striker made a defender, and this basically this big brute, um, they became a defensive pair that was just incredible for Forest because they could adapt to any team, because they were ultimately always comfortable with uncomfortable and they embraced it so they didn't fear it they they embraced it and you know the new normal which has now lost its power given the situation we're in but you know if you're always open to a new normal then actually it creates new opportunities rather than uh, makes you fearful of it martin o'neill um he was an amazing player i have a personal relationship um with him because my father uh, well, his, his first wife or his girlfriend worked for my father. So Martin O'Neill was always like one of my favourite players. Unfortunately, he was a terrible manager at Nottingham Forest. Not terrible. He wasn't very good at Nottingham Forest. He was an amazing manager at Celtic and Leicester. But he was a real intelligent player. Um, and the thing that he has always been good, which was very much like Clough, it's like know who you're playing with and what they're playing for. We, we often fall in the trap of looking at our discipline independently individually or in a vacuum but the whole point of creativity is like working with people and working towards the best possible work and if you understand who they are what they're looking for you get more out of them it's not just about the discipline it's about the individual within that discipline and martin o'neill was great at that and i'm a big believer in just finding out the character and the characters of the people you're working with because that helps unlock even more powerful work rather than just everyone working to the same uh, approach and process. I mean, there's always going to be an element of that, but this is creativity is, is born from uh, the way that people see the world. And if you can connect to people and understand how they do it, then it's capable of so much more. And I worry that sometimes we just focus on the job title rather than the person behind it. And Clough and Martin O'Neill were great at understanding that if you spent time knowing the people you were working with, you could make them uh, play to a game and a standard that was beyond anything you'd ever imagine. Just like Martin O'Neill did. He was in Nottingham Forest uh, before Brian Clough joined. He was just a journeyman. Same with John Robertson. Cloughy and Peter Taylor turned them into European champions. That's what happens when you spend time knowing people, understanding their strengths and helping them be better than they thought they could be. Uh, yes, that's Roy Keane. Yes, he's in a Man United top, but he got his big uh, football break when Brian Clough brought him over. Brian Clough loved him. Um, he's shaking the hand of Alfinger Haaland, um, who also, ironically, was brought to England by Nottingham Forest and then ended up in the worst feud with Roy Keane because of a tackle that turned into something nasty. But it's always with Roy Keane and Clough embraced it. it was playing to the edge, not the middle. He didn't want a safe player. Uh, he wanted him to push and bang his head right to the edge. And there's risks with that. Of course, uh, Keane got sent off a lot. Um, but you're not going to change anything if you're playing to where you feel comfortable. Pushing to the edge, pushing to absolutely the limits of what you think that person can go or be can change everything. It can open up new opportunities. It can make you a legend. And we're 
we're here to help our clients move forward in the most interesting ways that people want to be a part of rather than have to be uh, brainwashed into. But if we're not playing to the edge of where culture is going or the subculture of that particular category, then we're always going to be sat in the middle. And people like Keane pushing, pushing what midfield was. You know, and there's a great interview I watched recently with the, the player that he uh, replaced, who basically said he looked at Keane and just goes, now I was a good player, but Keane, Keane was just you know, pushing the boundaries every time. His energy, his commitment, his drive, he wanted to move forward always. And I feel that the thing that we owe our clients the most is the ability to connect to their audience in the most powerful ways. And that is playing to the edge of where that audience is heading rather than where they are. So you're always bringing people along with you rather than just trying to play catch up. And Clough was really good at introducing players like that into his team, um, certainly in the earliest years. Um, this is Archie Gamble. Uh, this is him playing for Scotland against, uh, I think Amsterdam, uh, or the Netherlands, I should say, uh, where he scored a goal that, I mean, if it was a South American player, everyone would go, oh my God, um, they still lost, <laughs> but uh, it was great. But Archie, Archie was a midfielder and he, you know, he took his responsibility seriously. And the point of this was that Clough always demanded his players to always give their all, be up for it, um, know what you're there for. And even if you're not really involved in the game, it doesn't mean you can ever hang back. It's like always, always playing to what is expected of you and what your teammates expect of you and i think that when we talk about work there's often a reluctance for us to take um responsibility for what the end product is and we very quick to blame it on creatives if it's not there you don't get to interesting work unless everybody wants it you don't get to interesting work if everyone's not aligned to where it could be you don't get to intrigue if you're not really willing to accept what everyone wants to create and that means taking your responsibility seriously from, you know, creating a strategy that allows creatives to think is interesting, to manage a client to make sure that they're open to something that maybe they weren't really expecting, but actually delivers what they want in the most amazing way possible. And basically creatively, finding new ways to express an idea that basically you'd never considered, whatever that might be. I mean, I always talk about uh, the UX of the Tesla insane button. You know, that simple thing, you know, sports mode has been around for cars for years, but the electric car industry was, you know, tarred with this brush of it wasn't as fast as a, you know, a normal engine. So insane mode, I mean, that, that defined Tesla so much. It allowed people to feel confident to spend their money. They took it seriously. It wasn't just, let's just design a, you know, a system for this car that, you know, just does everything it needs. Everyone was like, what are we working towards? Let's all move that forward. Um, years ago, I got to interview a film director, a very famous film director. I said, how do you get everyone to work with you, you know, in a way where you're all committed to the same goal? And he said, well, I talk to them about what, what my vision is. And then I ask every single person that works with me, whether it's cameraman, sound, costume, to bring their expertise to make that vision better than I could ever imagine. But it's his vision not their version of it. It's like, this is where we're heading. I want you to make it even better, but not change the direction we're going. Clough did that with his players. And I think that's really important for us. Any creativity is a team sport, but it only works if everyone knows where they're heading and then brings their best to it. And that can only happen if you take your responsibility seriously. Um, this is Gary Bertels. He was either a bricklayer or a carpenter, I think, in Long Eaton. Um, then Forrest signed him and he scored incredibly important goals uh, that helped Forrest get to the next European Cup final. Um, he then went to Man U, I think. A lot of Forrest players went to Manchester United, which was quite a compliment. But what's also interesting is quite often they never really were that successful there because Clough had turned them into something that was really powerful for them, but didn't quite gel in other clubs. But what Clough was about was very much like, if, you're, if you've got it, then I don't care where you come from. Roy Keane from a small Irish football club, uh, Gary Bertels here, um, 
a bricklayer or carpenter, Kenny Burns, who was a striker. It's like, it was always like, it doesn't, there's a lot of worry about us always being an insider. We keep talking about, <clears throat> we've lost our seat at the boardroom table. We've not lost, lost our seat at the boardroom table because we're outsiders. We've lost it because we're not helping our clients in the way that they really need. And just being able to talk the language of them doesn't change that. That just means you're more like them and lose your objectivity, which ultimately is what can help clients move forward in ways they never imagined. Embracing being the outsider means that you can look at problems in a very fresh way. You might have to answer the solution like an insider in language and tonality and creativity and subcultural understanding. But being able to look at situations as an outsider and see what really needs to be done, that is a strength. And we're clicky. As an industry, maybe we're too clicky. Um, I certainly don't think I would get in the industry now if I was starting out because we talk about everyone needs to be a graduate. I didn't go to university. And, and there's lots of very clever people who don't go to university. Um, and I understand that we were trying to professionalize our reputation more, I get that. But ultimately, again, the best thing for our industry is the work we create rather than just the uh, education of the people we hire. So embracing the outsider, can be powerful for what we want to achieve both in the work we produce and where we want to go because at the moment uh yeah we've been doing this for a long time we could do better and maybe it's maybe it's about people who are not not the uh the cliche that is being hired and maybe creative people that are not given a chance or don't think that this industry is for them because the industry has turned their back on them and this is Stan Collymore, um, and it's him playing for Liverpool, and he got signed by Forrest when Brian Clough had gone. Um, but I had to put him in, because he embodies what Clough, and what I think we as an industry should always remember, it's play to be remembered. When you go out, the work you produce, you want it to be memorable. Even if you don't win, you want people to go, I remember that, I feel that, I was excited by that. Even at the worst, you will, you will probably get called in again uh, at a later date. But play to be remembered. It's not play to be uh, acknowledged or play to be pat on the head. It's play to be remembered. It's that extra 5%. It's that just pushing things that little bit further. Not for the stupid reasons, but because ultimately you want to do something that makes a difference, that's felt, seen, heard that shapes things um, and that ultimately for me is the most important of all of them that whatever you produce you want it to be remembered and felt in culture rather than just put out and communicating something um, and we're doing a lot of that there's some there's some agencies and people the ones that I personally gravitate to the ones where even if I'm not really loving what they've done has a point of view and I feel it and I notice it and it's not noticed for shock value it's noticed because it has a strong point of view and it's like I'm either in or I'm not but my god I respect that they're playing to be remembered for their audience um and I, every individual should be doing that from my perspective um now it's fair to say that Clough divided opinion um there are a lot of people that said he was a bully uh, megalomaniac, uh, arrogant, outspoken. But there was an equal amount of people, his players in particular, who even now still say that he was an inspiring, powerful, caring, loyal person. And I always think there's something quite interesting in that dividing of opinion because it means that you're doing something that's getting uh, noticed. Um, if everyone just loves you, it's a bit worrying for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing that Clough was, he had a clear position on how the game he loved should be played. And there's two things here. Um, one, the clear position. Like, he wanted, he wanted his football team to play a certain way and be progressive, and he wanted to keep moving it forward. But he loved it. You could tell he loved it. And that maybe is the real lesson here. Maybe we need to love what we do more uh, rather than like it. Love it. 
take care of it, really embrace it, understand what it feels and means to people. He loved it. And because of that, he wanted to move it further. He didn't want to just be good at it. He wanted to move it further in everything that he did. And he did that. He moved everything further. He moved players further. He moved football further. He moved Nottingham further. He moved success further. And there were absolute disasters along the way. And sadly, the way he ended his career is nowhere near as powerful as where he um, started. But when you look at that, everything he did was about pushing things forward. He was very strong in that desire to always advance the role of football rather than just keep it where it was. And that's why I think Clough was a genius. And that's why I think the most valuable lesson the industry can take on is not about just winning. Ultimately, anyone can win at some point, you know, um, but it's winning better. It's winning better. And for me, winning better is the work that we put out. Winning better is taking things to a place that you couldn't imagine. Winning better is about embracing innovation, technology, and doing something that just allows creativity to flourish in a way that culture wants to be a part of, that enhances, that moves them, that makes them feel they belong. Just like I did when Forrest won that first title, where a little kid in Nottingham suddenly felt important, heard, seen, and no longer in the shadows. And just in case you think that everything I'm saying is a bit nostalgic, and I appreciate that, I also appreciate it's pretty rambly. This Alvin Toffler quote kind of sums up why it is important to always be progressive in the work that we do. Because he said, the illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And people like Clough, they understood that. They were always looking to move things forward, change things up. And while he accepted that sometimes it wasn't going to work or sometimes it failed, it didn't stop him because he knew the only way to keep moving forward was to keep bringing new things in. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take from this overly long, overly sentimental odes to Nottingham Forest, it's be more clough, by which I mean don't aspire just to win. Always aspire to win better. Because the great irony is winning just keeps us where we are. Winning better is what will drive us forward, that will get us back where we belong. Because I'm worried that we're in danger of becoming Nottingham Forest in 1975. And the thing is, I genuinely believe we have the talent inside and based on the people I've met outside the industry who can take us somewhere new, take us to a better place, take us to be double European Cup winning Nottingham Forest. And I'd love that win better. Thank you so much for your time.